Okay, I have to say that this is a tall order coming after Mark and Carl. <laughs> uh, but we might think of my talk as being a regression to the mean <laughs> from, from Mark's. My department still considers me an outlier, but it's, anyway. Okay, so I'm going to talk about statistical inference for data visualization. Alrighty, so to start with, this kind of dates back to some things that Jim said before too. Uh, here's a picture from a paper by Amy Toth in 2010. Um, it's a picture of a, an LDA view, I mean linear discrimination analysis. Most of us have seen linear discrimination analysis before. It's, it's an LDA on um, 40 variables, 40 oligos, so it's microarray data, and 48 WASPs, and there were four types of WASPs. Actually, those 40 variables were um, reduced from several thousand variables originally. So these are the 40 that show the best separation. Um, so what do you see in this picture? Clusters? Four groups? Okay. So everyone can see that, right? Really? Okay, so I'm going to start with talking about two new protocols um, that we have for data visualization. This comes from a paper um, by Buya and a number of us um, that came out uh, several years ago. And the first proto pro protocol is Rorschach. Has anybody ever done a Rorschach test? Those ink blot tests? Um, the Rorschach basically for data visualization, show many pictures of data with nothing happening or pictures from a null distribution and get people to report what they see in those pictures. So here would be an example. Here, here are some Rorschachs. Do you see some things in those plots? Well, that's, um, that's one protocol, the Rorschach. The other protocol is a lineup and with the lineup, you embed the plot of the data in among plots of data generated from a null distribution. Right, so here are 20 plots. One of them is the actual data, and the other 19 are generated from a null distribution. Is any of these plots different? I mean, it's too tiny to really see, so I don't want you to strain your eyes too hard, but maybe some of you can see that this one's a little different. And that actually does happen to be the data plot. Um, and all the rest are null plots. OK, so that's the lineup uh, idea. And it comes from the idea of police lineups as well, which I'm hoping that nobody's ever been in a police lineup. Alrighty, so how does this fit into the classical framework? So we probably all have done some classical hypothesis testing course. Um, in the past, and you start off with a hypothesis, collect some data, calculate your test statistic, look at where your test statistic falls on the sampling distribution, and if it falls in the rejection region, or is it, if it's extreme in relation to the sampling distribution, then you reject the null hypothesis um, with the statement that uh, because the observed test statistic is extreme, this is evidence against the null hypothesis, right? That's the process. So for visual inference, the ideas are the same. So we have the same analogy, same system. Start off with a hypothesis. Now, this is not usually the case when you're plotting data. Um, but implicitly, when you make a plot of data, you have, a, you have some hypothesis in mind. Right, so by making a scatter plot or by making a density plot, you have some hypothesis in mind. This forces us to be explicit. Now, you don't have to be too explicit, right? But, and that's one of the benefits of data visualization, that we can find the unexpected and we, we want to keep that. What this does is allows us to embed things into a system where we're not doing post hoc tests, which are meaningless. Um, and, and it, it organises our minds a little better, I think. So start off with the hypothesis that the plot of the data is the test statistic, right? The plot of the data, it's another statistic, just like all the other numerical values that we 
have used before. So here's um, my scatter plot of two groups and one data value for each of those groups. It actually comes from a real data set where they were testing um, a toxic waste site in terms of concentrations of some bad chemicals. Alrighty, now here's where it varies some. So we don't have a sampling distribution, but we have, if we have a way to generate data from a null distribution, we can pull off instances from a sampling distribution without having to specify it. So here, if my, primarily I'm gonna just show permutations as a way of generating the null data in, in this talk, but there are a few other ways that we can generate data from um, a null distribution. So he, here's the lineup, and that's, that's basically making the comparison between the test statistic and the sampling distribution. And the test is if an independent observer can pick the data plot from the lineup, then that's a rejection of the null hypothesis, right? So it goes back to Sesame Street. And, and Hadley, since his name up came, came earlier, made a brilliant video for InfoViz a couple of years ago of Sesame Street of one of these things is not like the other one. Cookie Monster, I think, was singing that. All right, Heike Hoffman, my other collaborator on this, did an update on, on that video for um, a new paper on comparing plot designs, how, how to be able to say that one design is better than another that use, uses inference methods. She's got another beautiful video. Anyway, I thought this is a serious audience, so I'm not going to show those videos. Okay, so one of the considerations with this work is that the sampling distribution comparison is against a finite set, right? There's a limit to how much we can ask people to look at. So we're only going to show a handful of draws from that null distribution as a comparison set. So that's consideration one. So we don't have this guy. We don't have that continuous curve. What we have are a sample from that. And you know, well, I've got a little bit more on this. So we have a sample from that distribution. And here, plot 16 was my actual data plot. And the rest, so 11 falls in that place on the sampling distribution, um, 6 would fall in that spot, uh, 17 falls in that spot, and 16 is my data, spot, data plot. And it's quite extreme on that set. And in terms of the comparison plots, it's quite extreme. All right, that's consideration one. And to get some sense for the constraints of that, we have developed a set of measures of the quality of the lineup, which I'll talk about in a little bit, just very briefly. But one thing to keep in mind here is that in practice, we're using graphics in places where we have no quantification of a sampling distribution. We have no standard tests. Um, so all we have is a set of M minus one representatives from a sampling distribution, right? So we only have these guys. Alrighty, consideration two, what's the p-value, right? If you're going to do testing, you need a p-value. People like to have p-values, whether they are just used as crutches or not. Um, people need p-values for all sorts of things. So in this situation, what we have in a, with a lineup is that the observer might choose the, da the data plot just by chance, right? There's a chance that the observer picks a data plot by chance. That's our type one error, right? And that basically boils down to the p-value. Well, type one error you control for, but the p-value, the probability that they're going to pick their data plot by chance is one over m, if there are m plots in the lineup. And if we employ multiple observers, so multiple independent observers, we can get a finer resolution on that p-value by using a binomial distribution with 1 over m as the probability and k is the number of independent observers and uh, little x is the number of observers who chose the data plot out of the lineup. Right, so we can get a p-value on the base of that. Alrighty, consideration three. What's the power of the test? All right, we need to have some idea of how powerful the test is as well. So 
in the situation of whether you, when you have multiple ways that you can plot the data, um, you know, you have a choice of plot to use. So some types of plots are going to work better than others to reveal structure. And, and that's analogous to the power of a statistical test. So we first just define signal strength. And signal strength is defined as the proportion of observers who identify the data plot of the lineup. So if everybody chooses the data plot, this is a very powerful, very strong signal, right? If a handful of people, or if nobody picks a data plot, um, well, it, it, pa power is the probability of picking the data plot when the alternative hypothesis is true, right? So you can basically look at the proportion of the observers who identify the data plot. Alrighty, in the case where we have the same data but we're just using different plot design, that signal strength equals a power. And that way we can decide which is a better plot design. Right. So this is useful for designing graphics for particular um, information visualization or reporting um, purposes. Alrighty, so let's, let's have some fun. Um, so we're gonna do a few lineups. And uh, in each of these lineups, I've only got a couple, I'd like you to pick the plot that's the most different just keep it to yourself for a couple of seconds, right? And then, then I'll start polling. That gives us a little bit of independence. I mean, this is in, an, or in a crowd, you can't really get independence. But, but also think about why it is that you decided that it was the most different, right? So also think about the reasons for that because that second part is critical for us to make some statements about what the structure in the plot is that triggers the rejection, right? So it allows us to encompass many, many possible alternatives and still have valid p-values. Alrighty, and since, since Carl started with the election data, we're actually gonna start with a lineup of election data. And so, but I'll explain the data in a little bit. I just want you to look at those plots and pick which one is the most different. Um, they're ordered, I don't know whether you can see the numbers, but there's one to five in the top row, um, six to ten in the second row, down to 20 in the bottom right-hand corner. All right, which one do you think's different? I just heard a five, I heard a five. Any others? 13? Okay, 13. Any others? All right. Um, I'll talk about this one in a moment. This is a lovely package. The five is the data plot. And so in terms of the data, one of the things that Carl didn't say was the different pollsters have, um, there's a number of different pollsters working. So all I've done is taken the tracking polls from um, a public website since April until present day, uh, until today. And uh, the, there's only two major pollsters operating on that tracking um, scale, Rasmussen and Gallup. And all the others, uh, and Fox News recently have picked up enough, done enough polls that they also come out as a major pollster. But all the other polls, there's lots of different pollsters, are just grouped into other. So there's four groups, Rasmussen, Gallup, um, Other and Fox. Alrighty, so what have we learned by this? Actually, I didn't ask you, why do you think it's different? They're all shifted, right? And so this is evidence that there's actually a, a bias uh, between the... There's a different, different mean for the different pollsters. Um, the order... So the, de the rest of the charts were created by permuting the pollster. So I randomized the pollster name, reassigned the pollster to poll so that all the others were created under the assumption that there's no difference. So un underlying these charts is the null hypothesis is that there are no, 
there's no difference between pollsters. They're all reporting the same thing. Alrighty? So we pick the data plot out of that, the rest, that gives us evidence to say there is something different about the pollsters. And I think you, if you read Nate Silver's blog and various others, you'll know, you'll, you'll know that. Um, and there was a very interesting article, I think, last Friday in Nate's um, blog, or, uh, his article, about all the pollsters that are operating, they don't operate independently either. I think a, a week or so ago, Gallup adjusted their polls. Um, so they adjusted the way that they're, they're measuring and reporting their polls. And I don't know the reasons for that, but he was, his article was more about all the small-time pollsters. Um, the quality may not be so good between those, and the way he worked that out is by looking at the polls that were reported before the major polls reported before the major polls is reported. And the results are quite different. They're much more variable. If, if they report just after one of the major pollsters, their results are very similar to the major pollsters. So there was like this lemming behavior of pollsters, is what he was arguing. All righty, ready for another one? All righty, pick the one that's different. And, and this one comes from work uh, by one of the ecologists on campus. So it's another real data problem. Got some answers? 15? Anybody else? 17? Anybody else? 4? Four. Four. Okay, anybody else? Six? What'd you say? Six? Okay, I'm getting a lot of different answers, all right? Let me reveal the real data. Is this one? Okay, and it, this is... <laughs> an ecologist came to me and said, oh, look, all my statistical tests don't show any significance, but I'm sure there's something here. Right, and that's it's kind of a valid thing, um, valid statement to make because there's often different sorts of variation that make it very difficult for statistical tests to pick up on something. It's a pretty small data set. So I said, okay, yeah, let's, let's take a look at it with the visual inference methods. And after this, yeah, he became convinced that he cannot, he, there is no relationship, right? You're all giving me different answers. I don't know that anybody picked 10. Um, that's tells us that the data is consistent with the null hypothesis that there is no relationship between um, those two variables. That there was, yeah, I don't want to explain all the difference. But you had a hard time with that too, right? I, it was a bit slower to get some responses. All right, so this comes back to a few of the quality metrics. Um, one way that we're making some comparisons between the, the plots in the lineup is to look at the distance between the plots and all other permutations. If, if we're doing permutations, that's easy. And, and particularly, a lot of the methods of generating null data, we can automate, so you can generate a lot of them. We just can't show people very many. So I calculate the a distance between the two plots by binning up the plot and calculating what data's in that space. It, we've got a number of different distance metrics to try to compare plots. They're still pretty rough right now, but the, these ones are calculated by binning up the, the plot space, calculating how many cases, so roughly doing that 2D density plot in here, and then comparing the counts from this plot to that plot. And comparing that with uh, many permutations, and then taking the average of those values. So on that scale, um, the, the gray curves here are all the interplot distances from just permuted, plot, from permuted data from one to another. So these are the distances that I get from one plot to the next, if they all are just permutations of each other. Um, the little black lines, those are the, li those are the actual ones that were in the lineup, and the orange is the actual data plot. So for that first lineup that I showed you, that was kind of an easy one, right? Because the data plot is quite different on that rough 
um, calculation of similarity than the others. In the second one, the data plot is very much like just another permutation of the other. So it, it, th these are, we're not um, fully done with this work yet, but the idea is to get some sense of how much coverage of the sampling distribution we're getting of the plots in the lineup. Um, and, and particularly how close other plots in the lineup are to the actual data plot. Very difficult to measure, but we're going to try to do that. Alrighty, another thing, calculate the pivots and the signal strength. So um, I'm not, I was going to try to do this on the fly here, but we heard with the first picture, I heard quite a lot of fives. And so I think we maybe have 50 or 60 people here. Um, five would be a p-value of zero and, well, if I had just five people say the data plot um, out of uh, 50 or 60, still the p-value would be pretty low. It'll be a little bit higher than 0.01, um, but I think there were more than five people, maybe 10 or so out of the 60 of us. Whereas for the second lineup, um, the p-value would have been one because I don't think anybody reported 10, right? Okay. Alrighty, so back to the wasps. I started with the wasps and that's kind of consistent with the topic of today, um, the large scale, large data problems. So on uh, the next plot, I have a lineup of the wasp data in amongst null plots. Now, you've seen the data of the wasps, so I can't show that to you again because you're all contaminated. You're not, you're not valid observers anymore because you've seen the data, right? So what I've done is simulate it. So um, here's a lineup. I want you to pick the plot where the data is the most spread, where the groups are the most spread apart. Two, three, four, any others? Okay, I'll reveal, that, that's the data. And, and actually it is the actual WASP data. So it's the same picture I showed you back on the second slide. I just used different colors. But you, I mean, it's so, you couldn't recognize that anyway. But I just wanted to make sure you didn't get, anyway, you could, no one saw that. No, no, it's not. That, but this is the data plot, right? And all the others are null plots. So all the others are produced by permuting the label of the WASP, uh, rerunning LDA, and plotting the best separation. So, yeah, it's, it's not the most separated. What it tells you is that you cannot reject the null, right? So, we did this experiment with um, Turkus. So, Mark talked about Amazon Turkus. We're, we've been using Amazon Turk for this work too. We showed 76 Turk workers um, a lineup of either the WASP data, so just like that last one or one where every single plot was purely noise. So all the plots in the lineup were, were done by permuting the group. And these are the results. Oh, I think I haven't calculated 76 correct, but there were 65 people that saw, that's more than 76 people, 65 people that saw the WASPs lineup, not a single one got it correct. So that says the p-value is one for the real data. And on the noise line out, actually they did very well. It just happened, happened we actually had three rep, rep, replicates for each of these, but it just happened that one of the reps, the um, actual data was actually the most separated. So, and, and people picked up on that. So basically noise data has a smaller p-value than the WASPs data. 
So there is no real separation in those groups. And this is the issue that we're working with with genetic data a lot. And it's not just people in biology that have fallen for this. The very first statistics paper that came out on gene expression data made the same mistake. I mean, for starters, you don't use LDA on this data. You have big problems in estimation with LDA. You need to use some sort of penalised um, dimension reduction. But the same thing with, with all the genetic data now, that, that size, um, Distinguishing between noise and real separation is very, very difficult. So the, we did a, a much larger Turk study with real simulated data just to get a handle on what people might be able to see in terms of real separation. And not that huge a study, but a bit. But basically, with the WASPs data, the separation that we see is just simply due to high dimensions. So it's just because when you've got high dimensional spaces, it, many different ways that you carve it up, you can get separation between the groups. So it's just a matter of space issue. So we did a, a larger study with dimensions of um, P from 20 to 100 and projection dimension either one or two. And in some data sets, we had real separation. Uh, for the 1D projections, we just had two groups, and we split the first variable apart by six units. That's a big separation, but all the rest of the dimensions were noise. For the, 3D, for the 2D projections, we had three groups, and each of those groups were shifted apart. Um, the means were shifted apart by six. And we want to see just whether people could detect real separation in the low-dimensional projections of their high-dimensional data when there's real separation or when there's noise. So, Here's one, one of the lineups that people saw. Um, and this is the 1D projection. So horizontally is the one dimensional projection. Vertically, the data is just jittered, just, split up, just spread out a little bit. Which one of these is the most separated? Say that again. 15? 20? It is 20. Did you get that? Cool. Yeah. I, it, it, so also other things that we're looking at is position, um, position in the lineup, whether position matters. So whether people notice things if it's down in position 20 versus position 1, 2. That, those are all things that we need to know to be, get a handle on this work. All right, here's a 2D projection. So um, I'm starting with 40 dimensions and projecting down to 2D, and I've got three groups. Which ones are most separated now? Twelve? Twelve? Jeez. <laughs> you guys are good. Ah, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. No, but it's just impressive that statisticians have got good visual skills too. <laughs> Alrighty, so here's a little, here's a look at the results. Um, here I've got a dimension plotted horizontally in each of the plots and the proportion correct plotted vertically in each of the charts, and then it's split out by two of the factors, by whether it's a 1D or 2D projection, and whether it's real separation or noise. And uh, so we're looking at proportion correct, and the line there is just a lower smoother on it. And so what we see is that the proportion that people get correct is pretty high when there's real separation and the, the dimension is low. It drops off, but it's still higher than noise. So the bottom row is just pure noise. And the, that, those results are consistent pretty much with that type 1 error rate. But, but so people are pretty good at picking up when there's a difference. I mean, it's a tiny little difference. It's just a separation in one variable over 40 dimensions, 60 dimensions, 100 dimensions. Right. Um, so it's not, it's not hopeless to be thinking about making separations of high-dimensional data, of classes in high-dimensional data. 
but, but teasing apart the um, noise and the signal is difficult. And also getting the message across to people in different areas. And I, I think one of the benefits here is uh, that people might buy into, okay, yeah, so it's just noise. I don't really have any signal. Like my ecologist friend was convinced. Um, whereas from just looking at a bunch of numerical tests, he was still thinking, no, 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 there's something. But I think, I think it has a, a way, way that we might be able to teach people about variation and, and randomness. Alrighty, another thing that we look at is the time that they take to answer. So here's the same sort of picture. I've got dimension plotted horizontally, and the vertical axis is how long they took to respond. Um, it's on a bit of a funky scale, but then the two plots are 1D projections and 2D projections. And roughly, and, and, yeah, and, and pink is real when there's real separation, blue is when there's noise. And one of the things I really do like to encourage is plotting all the data, and I just plotted all the... So it looks a bit busy here because it's every single response. And you do see that people generally pick up on, this, on the data plot or on their choice, make, so I, we don't, not saying whether they picked the data plot or not here, just saying how fast they responded. And generally they respond a little bit faster when there's real separation and when the dimension is small. Alrighty, another thing to look at, this is a pretty busy, complicated picture, but I think it's interesting. So we also want to see what it is that people are picking up on in the lineups. And uh, this plot has got a picture of every lineup that was shown to the Turkers. And each little pin in that plot corresponds to one plot in a lineup. Right, so for each of those little boxes up here, I've got 20 pins. And one, so, so 19 of those pins are null data or null plots, and one of them's a real. So the, the red one in each of them is actually the real data plot. The height of that pin is the proportion of people that chose that one out of the lineup. Alrighty, and so uh, horizontally, we're roughly going from um, distance between the means. So I've got a W within to between ratio for measuring difference between the means, just to get some sort of sense of quantification, because I'm, I'm simulating from a pretty standard model here. That's a reasonable statistic to, to, to use. And it, so if the pin is on the left-hand side of each plot, it means that there was a big difference between the means. And people are, if the height of that pin is high, it means that people are picking up on that difference. So I think you can see, uh, and so the, very, the top three rows are where there were real separations between the, the groups, and the bottom three are pure noise. And I think you can see a difference between those top three and the bottom three. Um, and the top three, when the dimension is small, people are pretty commonly getting the actual data plot, which happens to also be the plot with the lowest um, or the lowest p-value, the biggest difference between the means. As the distance increases, you see less of that. Um, the real data plot becomes buried in, in the other plots as well. There's not as much distance between the means relative to the other plots in the lineup. Um, but, but even when the real data plot gets buried, people have a tendency to pick up the one that has the biggest difference. You see the, the height of the pins tends to be on the left-hand side in most of those plots. It's not always the real data plot, but it's um, close to that end. So even when they're not picking up the data plot, they, pretend, they are doing pretty well at picking the plot that has the biggest separation between the means. So that's a pretty interesting to know. It also tells us something about which lineup to dig into later um, when, when those picks don't match, because so to see what people are queuing on in the structure of the plot. Alrighty, so if you want to try, I'm running out of time, if you want to try, you can actually go to these web pages and run through them yourself. Um, if anyone wants those, I can put them up later. But we, the actual data collection's gone, but uh, finished, but we still will take a look at this um, 
you, you can still take a look at those sites and, and play these games. There's seven different Turk experiments that we've done so far. Alrighty, one other thing that I wanted to do is talk about the, um, some of the mechanics. Um, we have a package on CRAN called Nullabore, and one of the things about this package is it allows you to be your own tester. So instead of plotting your data straight up, you put your data in a lineup straight up. And that way you can see whether you can pick your data out. And it has it encrypts the answer. So that decrypt that you saw on the previous slides, that's um, the statement that comes out of the lineup function. And then you can run that decrypt to reveal the place of the real data plot later. And there's a number of different ways to, to use things. Right, I've got, I just want to deviate a little bit because I learned that Carl is a tennis fan. I thought we might take a look at the US Open data from um, early September and see what statistics for women make a difference in whether um, they go to the final rounds of the tournament. So let's take a look at this one. I'm going to look at the receiving points won by the matches that a um, player got to. So the higher the number of the matches means the further in the tournament they went. So here's a lineup on the fly of um, matches vertically, so what round they got to, and receiving points won horizontally. Is one of those plots different from the others? 12. This one. Right, let's see. I can take the decrypt and run it. And yeah, 12 is the data. So that would say that receiving points for women is pretty important. Let's take a look at another one. Do you think aces are important? What do you think? So this is now aces plotted horizontally against round number. Can you pick the one that's different? 11. Any others? Two. Six. No other choices? Let's take a look. Six. Six is the actual data. And a few people picked that. So, I don't know, maybe? We know for Serena it's definitely important. I mean, she's changed the game up enormously. All right, I need to wrap it up. So, coming back to election data, we want to know who's going to win. <laughs> so, what I've done here is do a plot of the Electoral College. Um, so, the states are stacked up vertically according to which candidate they're going to go for. They're, they're going to, um, the vote's going to go for which candidate. And blue means Obama and red means Romney. Horizontally, it's the amount of electoral votes of that state that would go. Sorry, no. Vertically is the amount of electoral votes. That's what they're stacking up. Horizontally, it's the margin. So which plot's most different? <laughs> All righty, I'm going to leave it at that. Exactly. Uh, you know, I can't, well, that, that one is the actual one um, as of yesterday. But I don't know, you can't exactly pick that or you're a bit biased and you don't want to pick, you have your own candidate. Anyway, yeah, I, I can't, I think it actually tells us it's a bit of a toss-up still. Um, there's a lot of foundations to this work, and so a lot of this is documented in the paper by Buya. Um, but I want to just finish up with final thoughts. That is, I think um, visual infras, what we've 
what we've learnt from our Turk experiments is that visual inference is, will offer an alternative when there are no numerical tests. Um, and then this is an issue for large data because with increasing size of data today, it's very easy to get statistical, st statist statistical significance. It's not necessarily practical significance. And so visual inference, I think, yields results closer to practical significance. And based on what Jim said earlier, can we believe what we see? That's a skepticism. But on flip side of that, that just equally important is can we believe what we don't see? Right? If you're just doing a numerical test and spitting out a number and spitting out a p-value, I'm not convinced. I need pictures to go along with that too. I think that's just as important. And thank you very much for listening. <laughs>